you've tuned in to Tech Society, Perth's foremost podcast on tech and business, hosted by technical founders of Ninja Software and whiskey enthusiasts, Alex Dunmo and John Nguyen. And before we begin this episode, just quickly, is it time for your business to evolve? Yes, it is. So come see Ninja Software, njs.dev. All right, let's get into the episode. Hey techies, welcome to another episode of Tech Society. Last year, we had the opportunity to meet with the executive director of the Pawsey Supercomputing Center. Mark gave us a tour of Pawsey and let us get up close and personal with the supercomputer. In today's episode, we learned what actually is a supercomputer. We discovered how the Pawsey supercomputer plays a part in the international project called the Square Kilometer Array and why data science is a booming career and will only grow in demand. We also learned how data and compute is powering the next industrial revolution, making it the new oil. So I'm Mark Stickles. I'm the executive director of the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre here in Perth. I've been in that role for a couple of years. I joined in 2018. I'm originally from the UK, so I should say my origins are from from England, but but really grew up in Perth, emigrated. So you've been here since yeah the 70s. There's, yeah, there's, there's no then <laughs> no detectable English accent. No, yeah. no. <laughs> but yeah, grew up educated here in Perth. I've worked in universities and and research organisations most of my career, but joining Pawsey, Pawsey's been uh, a really interesting you know couple of years, and it's a partnership. Not a lot of people know about Pawsey in Perth, and I think one of my jobs is to to make sure people do. So you joined in 2018. What was your life like before that? I was working in a role at the University of Western Australia with an outward facing sort of role. So industry and innovation role at UWA. We were setting up sort of entrepreneurship hubs and innovation Mm. quarters at UWA and really trying to bring industry and government to work with the university across all sorts of disciplines more directly. Before that, I'd had a more specific role around research in the oil and gas and energy mining sort of sector. Spent several years in in that sort of capacity. But the last two years, two and a half years, it's been all things sort of digital and supercomputing. Mm. It's always been a natural progression for you then, kind of STEM-ish, not a STEM background, but in STEM related fields. I I tend to put the A in STEM and talk about (laughs) STEAM. I do that. That's something I'm quite, quite keen on because I think there's a great need for, you know, creative thinking and approaches to learning that that value all sorts of disciplines so so my original background is I, I did an arts degree with with honors in English literature in in the 90s and I've studied other other things along the way but I guess I've kept this commitment to to learning and, and and working with you know very interesting people and creating new businesses and opportunities in the sort of research space and now in in supercomputing we're an enabling sort of technical in, mm. and, and expertise led infrastructure that's supporting research across across the country and in collaborations around the world lacking those let's say stem tech credentials did you feel a real sense of imposter syndrome when you yeah, took my over question the role is, yeah. with an arts background surrounded by tech people does that introduce friction or does that introduce lubrication it's been it's been great to work with them it's not without its challenges i don't pretend to to know something at a a deep technical level you're working with colleagues that have spent decades Mm. in in their pursuit of their their expertise in a particular area i think my skill is in asking good questions and making connections and and unlocking opportunities and I describe myself as having Vegemite expertise you know, I, have a, I have a little bit of expertise and spread it fairly thinly um, and others have very deep expertise yeah that's an interesting point basically the whole thing about don't be the smartest person in the room or you're in the wrong room like ourselves we try to surround ourselves with very smart people as well I guess at the end of the day you always have to be able to learn from someone to be able to move forward so yeah so pausey the name is actually quite interesting and uh, i haven't actually asked this yet but why is it called pausey so pausey is named after dr joseph pausey mm. so dr pausey is one of the sort of founding scientists in the field of interferometry which is a, a sort of discipline within physics but it's essentially some of the science that underpins radio astronomy so mm. About 70, 75 years ago, the first experiments were undertaken, taking some of the experimental work around radar mm. in World War uh, Two, to apply that sort of science to to astronomy, and it opened up another another field. So, 
Dr. Pawsey was a, a CSI scientist and worked with a, with a group of colleagues to build experimental infrastructure in Sydney to run the first experiments in radio astronomy in Australia. That at the time was also connected to the very earliest computers in Australia. There's been a great relationship between advanced computing in this country and science. And in establishing Pawsey in 2013, that name was given because we're a, a facility that supports radio astronomy in this country, which is one of the, the science strengths of, of Australia. And in building a supercomputer and a purpose-built facility to support radio astronomy, the, the name Pawsey was, uh, was given. On the topic of radio astronomy, can you tell us more about the uh, SKA? Yeah, great. Well, the reason we were established was to support Australia's participation in the SKA. So the Square Kilometre Array is, mm -hmm. a, is a truly sort of global science project that has two major components. It has a set of, of, of instrumentation and telescopes that are being installed in the Midwest of Western Australia mm -hmm. and another set that is being installed in South Africa. Different frequencies, so low band here in Western Australia and mid band in, in South Africa. It's about 800 kilometres north of Perth and about 400 kilometres inland that the the initial site for the Square Kilometre Array is, is being established as part mm. of the Murchison Radio Observatory. And there's a direct link to Pawsey to help process the, the vast array of data that's uh, collected by those telescopes. I was going to ask, so why does it need a supercomputer? The, the data volumes are immense. So there's mm. actually a supercomputer in the desert as well that acts as a correlator to oh, take cool. all of the data off thousands of telescopes and those mm. telescopes are of different configurations and size and spread across you know, tens of kilometres and then sends the, the data to, to Pawsey to process into data products for the scientists to analyse and produce those amazing images of the galaxy and you know, universal phenomena mm. at such a fine level of detail and in time frames that enable them to go back to the various early, earliest origins of the universe and make some sort of fundamental assessments of the conditions at the time. Really cool stuff, but also with, with broader application because it's the, it's the science of radio astronomy that actually gave the world Wi-Fi. So hmm. it's that, that, that commercial yeah. application of this advanced science. And that was, was CSIRO as that well. That was absolutely, it? Yeah. yeah. CSIRO, and there was a national recognition of that and, and a fund established on the, on the commercial licensing of that technology to the world. I have a slightly technical question. I know it's not. Don't get too technical <laughs> on me, John. <laughs> Is the square kilometre array actually a square kilometre? I, it, it will be. I mean, it's over. <laughs> over it, it, there's an area the size of the Netherlands that's yeah. been set aside that only has about wow. 100 people yeah. resident there, and it's designated a radio free zone in order to create the conditions to okay. spread this array of telescopes over a square um, kilometre. Over a square okay. kilometre. Yeah. But they're working. What, uh, one thing I should acknowledge is that is the telescope is on. Um, Wadjuri Yamaji land. Mm. And so they're working very closely with the traditional owners of that land in order to identify where they place the telescopes and work in partnership with the local community. They're doing extensive environmental and cultural surveys. So the original design was this, and I'm waving my hands around here for, a, for an audio <laughs> podcast might not work, but <laughs> then if you, you need to see it from from space, if you like, above, yeah. and the array and the orientation of telescopes, they're in sort of 256 blocks and those sorts of configurations. There's a great virtual tour. You can do a fly through and yeah. we'll, we'll put the link in the podcast to, yeah, for people will. that have yeah. a, ha, literally you can do a virtual tour of the, of the telescope and it takes you back to Pawsey and you can do a tour of Pawsey online as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Does it, does it have the new computers in it, in the tour? Not the new computers. We've announced this this later this well, a couple of months ago we mm. announced the new system so Pawsey's current systems are petaflop systems and the dedicated systems supporting some of the telescopes are coming towards end of life and we had a 70 million dollar investment from the Australian government into upgrading that infrastructure and, and we announced a new system in October so we'll start we're doing some building works to fit the energy and cooling requirements for for the uh, supercomputer in the first part of next year and then by the middle of next year we'll we'll start installing the new system and then switch off the current ones in mm. install the first stage of the, the new system and then in 2022 go to full operations it'll be over 200,000 cpu cores 750 gpus <laughs> and 548 terabytes of of ram or memory right yeah. It is, the, I think they're the approximate numbers. numbers. I think the specific numbers, we, we haven't released the specific numbers yet, but yeah, approximately, yeah. I mean, it's it's estimated to be a 50 petaflop system, yep. which is 
about 30 times more than our current capacity. Importantly, because of the change of architecture to move to a, a CPU, GPU combination in, in our architecture, mm. we can thank the gaming community for their advances <laughs> in driving this. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll actually do that with a, a marginal increase in energy um, consumption. So it's much more energy efficient, efficient for the, the, the petaflop performance that we will generate. What, what do the energy differences look like between the old and the new system? For about a 30x increase, we're increasing our total capa power by about 50%. Wow. So from sort of a single pe a single megawatt to somewhere around one and a half mm. yeah. for a 30x increase, which is tremendous. And, and it's important for, for all you know, data intensive industries and science mm. is, is very data intensive to, to look at its energy footprint and What's how it's you know it's it's credentials in this area what's the what's the solar panel installation like at Pawsey? that that provides about 160 180 kilowatts of of power mm -hmm. that largely drives the cooling system for us which is a renewable cooling system using aquifer water so we take water out of the aquifer below us which a lot of perth supply of water it's a precious resource here mm -hmm. in wa we draw from the aquifer we inject it in at a cooler temperature. It, it's then condensed and blown across the, the computers to keep them cool. It heats, it then is re-injected into a different part of the aquifer and then recharges and cools and creates a, a closed loop. So we recycle a lot of water to, uh, to save that, that side of our operations. Millions of litres. Is that a, like a unique setup? What's, I what's think the it's novel, novel for our for our system, but uh, I think many centres around the world are looking at, at, at interesting ways to explore managing their, their energy footprints. So mm. a, a lot of facilities will have their own you know, on-site generation capacity, but we don't have that. We, we draw from the grid, so we're concerned about making sure we, we use what we use efficiently. But I'm interested in exploring what we might be able to do with, with battery technology here in, in WA, given the, the interest in, in our role in WA with respect to the battery industry. So mm. that's that's something we you know I'm keen to explore over the next year or so. So do you do work with the Australian Space Agency? We do. Yes, they they invested wow. one and a half million dollars in this facility over the next two years. Oh, brilliant. Uh, and and definitely in Western Australia, there's a there's a remote operations facility that that's been has, um, invested in by the West Australian government and the agency. And we've got facilities here operated by NASA, by the European Space Agency, and geographically we're well positioned to contribute to the, the global sort of space industry effort out of, out of WA. So we don't just have great mineral and sort mm -hmm. of energy resources, we actually have tremendous geography and I think some, some application opportunity around the growing sort of space industry. We may not launch rockets here from WA, but in mm. terms of the ground to space communications and industrial applications derived from space, I think there's great opportunity. I want to ask you some stuff about Pawsey and its diversity angle because you know we're, we're in tech, we're in software and- A lot of dudes. Yeah, a lot of dudes. A lot of dudes. Well, how does Pawsey tackle this problem? It is, it is something I've, I've I thought about when I joined Pawsey and in fact my, my first public address at an industry conference I got up and said there's there's more people named Mark at Pawsey than there are women so <laughs> and we had lots of marks and I didn't subsequently sack a few of them to help our, our numbers <laughs> of the great people and I'm happy to be one of them but we've made a concerted effort to recruit women and people with a diverse cultural and other backgrounds to be a more inclusive workforce and over the last two years I think our number of just as just as one measure uh, uh, women has gone from sort of 10 percent to 25 percent so that statistic of more women more men they mark than women is no longer a fact i'm pleased to say <laughs> and we've you know changed some of our recruitment practices to be very positive about um, being a welcoming um, and inclusive workplace promoted employment opportunities made some specific targeted efforts to recruit women into into certain roles and so we've been fortunate to recruit sysadmin, research fellows, project managers, our education and training manager, and it's really helped the, the diversity at Pawsey, and I, I'd argue make Pawsey a better place to work and a better business. But I do acknowledge there's a, a systemic challenge here, particularly if you look through the conventional pathways. The number of women enrolled in computer science and engineering degrees is in low teens, I think, percentage-wise. 18% was yeah. the last I saw. And that I number's saw. been yeah. stuck there for a long time. But I think we're seeing changes to the, the sort of education system mm. and the attitudes to education well, that is opening up alternative pathways and uh, recognising different types of pathways to a career in, in tech. I don't think that's a, 
it's, I mean, it's obviously not a genetic thing. And in the 70s and 80s, I think the percentage was like 28, 30%. I think there's there's just been, there's been a, something that's challenged that in 90s and 2000s. Well, on, on education, does, does the Palsy um, Centre do anything with schools, primary or secondary? We, we do, not so much with primary. I think mm. we've had a couple of primary groups through it and mm. to visit the centre and we run an internship program for, for students at university level, so a highly competitive, oversubscribed sort of summer mm. internship program. But we've had work experience students coming to Palsy and we're increasingly having programs engaging with, with young people in, in schools. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. We believe that you can create art and beauty with technology. We think big. We move quietly. We are Ninja Software. How does does a young person sign up to do work experience at Posi? We had sort of direct application last year so yeah. last year was was the first time we'd had some work experience students and we also partnered with one of the research centers that has a work experience program ICRA so ICRA is one of the radio astronomy oh, cool. groups and so we were we were part of their initiative what kind of stuff do they do last the last group spent a day I spoke to one of my colleagues who runs the platforms or describes itself as running everything with a blinky light inside palsy <laughs> that's a technical term and they got them because they'd had a lot of presentations about you know working in science and so on mm. he actually got a group of these these kids to pull apart KNL nodes I think he said so bits of hardware that we were decommissioning that mm. the kids the kids the young people actually got to touch and be tactile and actually do some some hands-on work because a lot of their experience is sort of watching but it is a working progress for us so we're probably doing more of awareness raising and engaging with teachers and running programs so we we ran a program last year before COVID where we had a dozen students from different schools come into Pawsey mm. to remotely operate the Parkes telescope for the morning. So you know the classic, the dish. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So they were able to see the operating facility and 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 calibrate the telescope using the computers at Pawsey in a training yeah. situation to get you know young people excited about the the science behind that and its applications in, in a sort of a applied way, which is kind of cool. What are some of the cool projects going on at Pawsey or that have been run at Pawsey? So we, we've a lot of case studies on our website, so you can find out the, the sort of science and the, and the researchers that are working on, on the case studies at Pawsey. And we've probably run about 400 projects a year, about half of those on our cloud infrastructure, so smaller sort of entry level projects, mm. and the other half on, on Magnus and, and other major supercomputers that you apply for and it's merit based science and so on. Some of them that are that appeal to, to my sort of interests. The, there's a project that we work with researchers at Curtin University that's looking at counting craters on Mars. <laughs> so they've been able to use the supercomputer to take some of the imagery that they've taken of Mars and process much more. You know, the earliest observations were, were taken manually. So to be able to do this using a supercomputer, they've got a much clearer picture of the geology and history of Mars. They also, that team also does work in identifying meteorites where they land in in australia so they use a series of satellite information and calibrate that using a supercomputer to say when a when a meteorite's seen in the sky they can Mm. determine where it's going to land and they've been successful in identifying locations where you know within meters of where where a meteorite's landed and I think that team was also behind that, to helping to find where the, where the, the Japanese little satellite probe that, that took some, oh, some yeah, data, yeah. took a core of a, of, a, of a meteorite and landed in the desert a few, few weeks ago. That team was also helping in, in identifying where that landed. So that, that's, that's really cool. There are, you'd expect as, as you'd expect, applications around energy and, and mining and those sorts of mm. things. So the, the design of the offshore structures and helping to optimize those structures for how they withstand cyclonic conditions and mm. so on and how the pipelines are, are embedded into the sea floor modeling that using advanced supercomputing is something that that we don't just do as a research f- um, function but the large or, the business. or businesses do it as a, as a yeah. commercial application and you mentioned them um, yeah businesses are working with like large amounts of data as well so that kind of expertise that you know palsy deals with huge amounts of data but actually does something useful with it we've come across many businesses that do collect data but don't actually know how to use it you know what's missing there yeah there's a there's a study that's just been put out by the wa data science innovation hub which is a a sort of a group that's trying to 
uplift the, the data literacy and data skills in WA industry. And it identifies data scientists as one of the, the growth jobs, mm. like a so 10 to 20% increase over the next decade. And there's over 30,000 people with that sort of data science role now. So it's definitely, there's a demand there for, for expertise and skills to, to work with industry. And by industry, I mean, very broadly defined. Mm. I mean, it really is growing roles in government, in industry, local government. And, and I guess small and medium enterprises are going to need to understand this space. It's not just in the domains of the, the large corporates that can have in-house capability and or or finance that using you know, lo- mm. you know much larger revenues mm. it is something that the businesses of all shapes and sizes will need to to get around so we're yeah we we are recruiting a data scientist for a, for a role at Pawsey. there's uh, there's growing courses and and training opportunities through through universities and 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 mm. other providers and it is it is something that there's a quote i wish i could say it neatly but it's like We've looked at sort of, you know, gold and, and oil and gas and so on as resources, but sort mm-hmm. of data is the, the new the new the resource new, to mine the into oil. the whatever yeah, yeah the data is the new, new oil whatever yeah. that is. I don't like saying anything's the new oil. But, I don't like um, saying oil either. It's no, just uh, the data is the new solar. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's just seemed to take no, it. Data is the new oil. Yeah, That's what yeah. Everyone seemed to take it and run with the concept that data is the new oil. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, oil oil powered the industrial revolution, so. It, yeah. That's the idea: it's is that data is going to power the next industrial revolution. Yeah. So if the twenty the twentieth century was was the hydrocarbon century, mm. then the twenty first is a is a digital one. Is there a lot of collaboration between the different countries on sharing results or even combining processing abilities? I think there's a degree of that, and and perhaps this year's made us look at that. Mm more constructively because we are we aren't traveling in the same way so we're but we're interestingly sort of connecting together particularly in our region so so last week i met with the directors of centers in, in asia so in singapore and in, in japan and we're planning a, a conference in february a virtual conference around supercomputing mm-hmm. asia and sort of to try and coalesce the the group of regional centers here you know in a in a more organized way we NCI, the, the Canberra Centre and, and Pawsey pulled their resources to p- make resources available in March and April to support COVID related research. And that's part of an international consortium of HBC centres doing the same same thing. So so it's there. There are national interests when it comes to some of the co-investments and that does direct where, th- where areas can collaborate or, or otherwise. But we ha- our role with the Square Kilometre Array as an international science project and our status as a research facility, I think, gives us that we're predisposed to actually look to, to collaborate and partner. Mm. I yeah, think that's, exactly. a, that's a positive. We're not a commercial operator. That's you know There are other commercial HPC providers. We've got an innovative company here in Perth that, that has a different technology down under GEO. That's a company that's launched this year. It's mm. listed this year. Sorry, it's been operating for, for many years using different supercomputing technology. But What's, so the, what's the relationship like between... Aussie <laughs> um, and DG. There's both of us. I think want to see Perth lifting, um, lifting the the sort of tide for mm. for innovation and, and 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 enterprise here in WA. So I guess it's like people that think the two organisations compete is actually incorrect. I, in my mind, it's incorrect. I think we both offer a different type of product in the sense of we we're a research partnership mm. owned by the universities and CSIRO, and down under Geo is is a listed company that's you know very been very successful over several years and and I think has has you know rightly you know global market aspirations. So we're both hungry for talent. We're both advertising positions here in, in Perth, and, and obviously down under has operations around the world so Mm -hmm. i think it's a good story to have both of the the national both facilities national and international here with with a presence in wa is pausey exclusively for research it is it is like the commercial ventures should be going to down under geo for for their supercomputing kind of thing it depends on the nature of their Mm. their requirement if they've got commercial requirements yes if if you know, there are other commercial providers industry partnering with universities and CSIRO can use pause these facilities but it's a research mm. option first and on a merit based p- proposal so it needs to be a quality science merit based partnering with a university or CSIRO as the as the predominant resource 
Mm-hmm. So we're publicly funded. We're, we're funded yeah. by the Australian government, the, the, the state government and our, and our own university and CSIRO partners. On that topic of funding, it's, it's a touchy subject, I know, but I'm curious about having, is it, is it difficult to justify what Pawsey does every year when the budget comes around? Or is it something that the government actually understands is valuable to Australia? Absolutely, you know, bipartisan when it comes to a need to invest in science yeah. and and and, mm. the, and we're not just investing in the infrastructure here; we're investing in the expertise and mm-hmm. the, and the the jobs and skills creation that spin off from a facility like Pawsey. Um, Pawsey is collaborative, multi-user. It generates it it acts as a draw, mm. a draw card. So there's there's bright people that have come from all around the world to work in our university and CSIRO sector mm. because they can have access to a supercomputing facility like Pawsey for research. We always have to demonstrate value to our investors and as a large, you know, as a receiver of large grants from the, the state and the Commonwealth, we have to you know, deliver mm. value. I think all the you know, universities and CSIRO are getting better at doing that, but that's a work in progress for us. Mm. We can't take for granted the, that everyone appreciates that having a facility like this is, is, is valuable. So highlighting the areas where we do make a difference and we do deliver some benefit to communities, to industry, to the environment is is, is is a job we we can't take for granted and we have to be clear in in that sort of value statement and benefit and, mm. and so on during the COVID 19 pandemic and lockdown did you see an uptick in the use of your nimbus cloud we, we refresh Nimbus so we upgraded the infrastructure I think in April, in March and so it came in brilliant timing, in time yeah. for us to to dedicate some additional resources towards some COVID specific research and just in general terms that's been a that's been a, an additional sort of resource for us mm. and, and growing in demand as a as an entry point for domains to scale up their computational science needs and then prepare for for larger applications on the on the, the larger systems like Magnus. So yes, short mm. answer, yes. My other observation about, about COVID and this year for, for Pawsey as a business, we've got about 50 to 55 staff. The majority of staff, we, we in early March, we went pre-lockdown and tested our ability to work remotely and so on. I'd say 60% of staff are still working remotely now at Pawsey. We've delivered the capital refresh on pretty much on time this year. We've turned all of our training programs to online and video and delivered, we've reached more people in terms of a training and outreach since this year than we would have done in wow. a pre-COVID yeah. year because we've used the technology differently. We used to send people on a plane to go and run a small workshop in <laughs> Adelaide or Melbourne. Mm. Now we're having international partnerships and training in partnership with others around the world. So they have, you know, our business is one of those businesses that has had some benefit from mm. the disruption this, this year of COVID, but I acknowledge many others have been completely disrupted in a way that's that's much harder mm. to, to, to bounce back from. And just overall, we've been very blessed here in WA from the way that the, the pandemic response has been managed and mm. our natural right. you know, geographic and other boundaries have sort of worked for us here. What's been the most challenging things for you in this role? I, I think at the outset, you asked me questions about sort of being a, a non-technologist mm. in a technology mm. business. And I, I think that was, I've led other initiatives before and this one, the scale of this one was, was a challenge. That mm-hmm. this, is, this was new to me to, to run a venture with this many people and, yeah. and, and to actually see the, the, the technology, you know, I could see and touch the technology. So I They think let you touch it? Not really. <laughs> I can open up a cabinet and show you the secret behind a supercomputer is not actually the, the blinky lights at the front, it's the mm. interconnect behind you it. You can't press so the, um, the big red button. Don't touch the big red buttons because yeah. that'll kill the power <laughs> to the building. <laughs> you've, clearly had a, you've clearly had my tour um, yeah. of, the, of the white space. So you know, I, I, it's an expert organization, lots of smart, te- some people have been yeah. involved for decades in this, in this space. So I, I do not have the, their deep expertise, but I understand our stakeholders. I understand mm. that the governance environment. I understand the challenges that we have, and I, you know, I've worked with people in this sort of environment before. And you were in your previous role. You were very deep in the kind of bureaucracies of research, right? University research. I led sort of industry and innovation mm. activities at UWA, so I wasn't necessarily deep. I was, I was, I was wide. Yeah. I think I, I now I, I've got with Pawsey both, you know, we do the talk about T-shaped, T-shaped managers and those yeah, sorts of things. Yeah. I, in Pawsey, I've had to get to know a bit of the T, not just the top. I think in my role at UWA, I was a bit more just the top. And I've I've actually loved getting to know a little bit about the, the technology and, and understand how 
you know, my colleagues' work and, and the, the applications that they develop to work with our scientists and, and to then see the stories of the science that's resulting from this. That mm. it's, there was a story by, by the CSIRO telescope folk. They, they, we gave them extra processing power and, and storage capability earlier on in the year, so pre, as COVID was hitting. So they could do a, 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 a mass survey and over the course of 10 days, they did what was taking you know, years before they were able mm. to do in 10 days, processed all of this galax galaxy images and identified an extra million galaxies and really, you know, and to see that we were part of that service and science and infrastructure was just, it just gives you a, a real buzz. Mm. And I think after, it's taken me sort of a year, I think about it, my first year, get to know the business, get to know the stakeholders and so on. We, we've reorganized, we've done some internal business and strategy processes. This year, I've got to know more about Pawsey at a deeper level, and and that's been a, a very good progression for me. I don't think I could have done the classical, you know, CEO first hundred days, run everything, do all of that. This <laughs> one, in this environment, the uh, perhaps the lead time and the burn time is a little bit longer, <laughs> but I have I have enjoyed it immensely. What's the future of Pawsey like? You mentioned twenty twenty two. What's going on for the next five years? We have recently announced our new system and our new architecture, so we've got a busy year next year to start installing, get the building ready, start installing the next phase of, of a 50 petaflop system. So that's mm -hmm. a, a, a massive um, opportunity for us. We're collaborating with, with a quantum computing startup. So there's a national, that is, it is exciting. Just there's an, a company out of uh, Canberra called Quantum Brilliance, and we're, we're working with them to access their emulator and to start to explore how some of our colleagues who are obviously focusing on future tech, what that might offer um, in the world of HPC. And there's a national effort, I think, to, to raise quantum capability in our country. So I think it's important that Pawsey and, and our other national centre, NCI, are, are part of that. We're continuing our efforts around training and education. So I'm optimistic that we will get continued support from the West Australian government in, in our next phase. They're a key supporter of Pawsey and we also get national funding. So to continue that program, we'll be able to do more in areas of STEM and outreach and skills development, which is quite important. We will go into the second year or in, in the first year and go into the second year of our space data facility. So we should start seeing some initial pilot projects and some applications developed out of, out of that facility. So Fantastic. some exciting things. Cool, all right, now time for our Final question. Final question. Whimsical question. So, wrestlers, when they come out before they're you know they're they're, you know, they're fighting that night, and they they come out into the crowd, and the lights go down, and the smoke machines start, and their intro music plays to set the tone for their character and make sure everyone knows what their character is all about. Obviously, you're not a WWF performer, but you do keynotes, and and you know you you come out on stage every now and then. I'm sure. If, if I was the organizer for the keynote and I said, Mark, what would you like your intro music to be? What would you choose? Gosh, okay. I, I have a family connection to Jimi Hendrix. Which, that's cool. Just kind of, kind of if, you, if you Google one of my uncles, he, he worked for Jimi Hendrix in the late 60s and into the early 70s. So, so it's a Jimi Hendrix song, I think, but it's also a cover. So I'm gonna go all along the Watchtower which is a, <laughs> actually a cover. People think the Jimi Hendrix song is the original, yeah. but it's well, a then he made it his own. It's yeah. a cover of a Bob Dylan song. Right. So I didn't know. Oh, he go, did he make didn't, it his own. Yeah. But yeah. he has made it his own. Excellent. Thanks, Excellent. Mark. Yeah. Okay, Thanks, thank Mark. you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, John. You've made it to the end of another episode of Tech Society. On This Week in Tech History, February 18th, 2021, the Perseverance rover, formerly called Mars 2020, became the first artificial object to land on Mars since the InSight Mars lander in 2018. Perseverance joins Sojourner, Spirit Opportunity and Curiosity as the fifth and latest Mars rover. Perseverance is the largest, most advanced rover NASA has sent to another world. Make sure you hit us up on Twitter, at Tech Society, head over to the website, subscribe to the newsletter.